Hey guys, what's up? It's John from Balcony Dow. We are here at the Avalanche Summit in Barcelona. Today we are sitting down with friend Mark with Near Protocol. Uh, Mark is the head of the grants program there. He runs a fast grant, which we'll tell you about in a bit, but uh, we're going to dive in today, learn a little bit about Near Protocol. I might look at why this might be a good fit for Balcony. Maybe Balcony shouldn't be on Ethereum. Maybe you could, maybe you could show me a little bit. You could change my mind. Maybe that's part of the process today. Uh, and maybe that helps give people a sense of whether or not their project belongs on Near. And you could tell us about some of what's going on. You guys are getting a lot of press lately. It seems like people are discovering Near all of a sudden. So, Mark, tell us, what is so special about Near? Well, where do I start, mate? Thanks for the intro. Um, I guess just a, a point of reference. I'm with the business development and ecosystem team. So, not the head of the funding team, but a proportion of the funding team. So. It's a very interesting time because we're starting to enter the layer one conversation, right? Previously, we weren't even being talked about. You had your typical conversations around Ethereum, Solana, Cardano, EOS, all these other blockchains, layer one smart contract platforms that, that but near wasn't even talked about. Um, and it's a really nice feeling to start to enter that conversation and enter it with gusto uh, because we've got a lot of serious investors who have been involved from the beginning you know, the likes of Coinbase Ventures, uh, Andreessen Horowitz, uh, Electric, those guys were there from the beginning, but recently we just closed a new funding round with the likes of Alameda, Jump Capital, uh, 3AC, all those guys that uh, really came to prominence or, or made very good bets on different ecosystems, which was uh, part of their momentous growth over the last year or so. So we think that having those guys involved in our ecosystem is uh, a harboring of really good things and lots of uh, exciting builders and uh, teams coming to, to play with us. Yeah, I mean, I guess everyone talks about like social proof in the Web3 space. I mean, your, your cap table is sort of like financial proof. <laughs> it's like capital proof. What was the size of that last round? Well, it was 150 million. Um, which you know is, isn't a lot of money when you're talking about crypto and a, uh, a team that has a market cap of around 11 billion. But I guess it's more about what that capital is going to enable within the ecosystem. You know, a very strong DeFi primitive um, marketplace is being built, and and we've got the the building blocks to uh, to help support all the composable elements of a really advanced DeFi um, ecosystem that's coming. So 150 million, but uh, there's also other investments that will be coming to light soon. Um, you know, very active in the market at the moment and lots of people very interested to participate in the ecosystem. Ooh, that was that big money coming show. Big money big coming show. I like that, that's pretty good. So here's my question. What does Andreessen and Jump, what do they see in you guys in terms of, is it the composability that they think is going to be the secret sauce? What is it about Near that they think this is the place where the puck is moving? Well, Near always had a reputation as good tech. You know, in that L1 conversation. Because they're San Francisco of, guys? Is it just Well, because? yeah, the San Francisco guys, but... It was just like, yeah, they've got good tech, but people were kind of meh, not really, not really looking under the covers further. Um, it was just a reputation for good tech, good tech background, good guys. And I think that's what these investors really saw. They're not really worried about, you know, the hype surrounding a blockchain or the marketing effort or anything like that. They, they, they bet on teams. Um, working with a lot of venture capitalists myself over the last six months, it's almost like they're you're not really that interested in the idea. The ideas are, are of course, integral, but you're betting on teams. You're, you're betting on the people and their ability to execute because the idea that they have might work, it might not work. You might run into challenges with regulation, with the go-to-market plan, the business model, all those kind of things. But once you get hold of a good team that can shape an idea and execute on that good idea, you want them in the ecosystem and you want them building and constantly iterating. Um, so I think that's where the, the foundation of the capital came from. You know, really good tech. Ilya and Alex, like absolute geniuses. Um, Google guys, right? They were Google guys? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And Microsoft and, you know, basically any, we've had our hands in, in any Silicon Valley um, kind of startup uh, with, with different guys. It's a lot of um, 
world championship programming winners at the, in, in the core team. So, um, you know, these guys who just see the matrix screen on their head, like numbers going here. <laughs> right, I, right. I, 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 like you and I. Well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. No. But um, yeah, I, I think the story that we're telling now is, yeah, we've, we've built that tech. We've got a, a really good foundation where these applications can come and build on top of Nia. So now that hype engine is starting to build up and, and we're gaining a lot of momentum. Okay, so let's let's talk about this, right? Let's let's put our L1 hat on, although I'm already wearing a different hat. On the L1 hat, right? I'm thinking, if I'm building an L1, the first thing I want, obviously, is a highly efficient system, right? That has low uh, gas fees to transact. That would be important to me, obviously. I'd want composability. I'd want to be able to bridge to other chains if I'm building an L1. And I want to make sure that I had fertile soil so that people can come and build strong DeFi products on top of that graph, right? I think if I was building that one, that would sort of be my, my list of priorities. Am I missing something? No, not at all. I think, you know, we've, the ben we've got the benefit. We've been on mainnet for roughly two years now. Um, and I guess the meme is that we are what Ethereum wants to be yep. because we've got that proof of stake built in. Mm -hmm. We've got that horizontal scaling via sharding built in and you know those predictable and efficient uh, gas costs that will uh, enable scalability um, for many applications and as well as private sharding as well so T talk about private sharding for a second so you know if you're sitting at home you wonder what a node is if you're if you're running a version of the blockchain locally you have a node right you own a node here right and so that node is necessary because it's helpful in putting all this data onto the blockchain. And the problem is if there's too much data going onto the blockchain at, at any given moment, gas fees have to increase so that the miners can decide which information goes on chain uh, and gets prioritized, right? So what NIR does is they have the sharding of that node, which means that in times of high capacity, those individual nodes are then sort of split uh, and it creates geometrically more bandwidth. How does that work and does it actually work? I mean, are you guys able with like, if you scale up to the point where you want to scale, can it actually hold? Well, it remains to be seen. I guess the proof will be in the pudding because we haven't seen the volume that other blockchains have seen yet. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're building towards, right? Um, and when it comes to sharding, so our, our sharding is called Nightshade and we're going through different phases within the roadmap. And we just completed phase zero, um, which was involved uh, several network upgrades. And the plan at this stage is to have the sharding phases complete by uh, 2023. Now, I will caveat with that with the fact that a lot of our core team is actually based in the Ukraine. So the events, the global events that are happening at the moment, um, you know, it's quite stressing uh, for, for a lot of people, quite stressful for a lot of people. Um, so, you know, just fingers crossed that that doesn't really um, affect the timelines that we've given ourselves. Uh, of course, it's, you know, there are much more things important in the world, but at the same time, I expect it, these events to really galvanize the team because it's showing that decentralized technology is really important for moving value around the world um, yes. when outside events could possibly affect that. Yeah, I mean, so I'm, I'm half Jewish, half Dominican, and, um, or as some might say, I'm fully Jewish and fully Dominican. <laughs> and, you know, I think any Jew in the world is looking at what's happening right now and looking at this technology and saying, you know, we would have had a very different outcome for Jews around the world uh, during the First and Second World War if there was the ability to move capital like this and preserve capital. And so uh, there, there are, and I, I mean, I, obviously there's other communities as well. Now I think Ukrainians feel the same way mm. as, any, as any Jew might. And I think the world is waking up to the idea that, you know, we need these solutions and also ID solutions as well, identity solutions yeah. uh, that need to go on chain and allow for anonymity. Um, and so I think that we're gonna see that this is gonna accelerate the use case for the blockchain in, in these ways as well. Well, we hope so. I think, you know, it's a shame that it's taken an event like this for the world to appreciate the use case of crypto. And let's not forget, 
there's a lot of people in Russia that don't agree with what their government has actioned. And these are the people that are hurting right now because, yep. you know, they're these, sanctioned. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a shame that this use case has to come to light because of, you know, these unfortunate events. But I guess the, the rest of the world is waking up to what we've known all along, right? It's also the integer opposite, right? Because the, the way you get Putin to behave is you put pressure and pain on the community, which is the citizenry of Russia. Whereas in our space, the community gets the leadership to behave mm -hmm. by putting pressure on them through sell-off pressure on the token, uh, for example. You know, and so we live in the inverse world, the world that people describe as like voting with your feet, or in America we vote with dollars, which is a very sinister idea mm -hmm. that's actually not true at all. You know, this actually takes those ideas and puts them to use in a way that's actually effective. Uh, which is a weird shill for geopolitics. Geopolitics <laughs> shill. Geopolitics <laughs> shill. Uh, back to Nier. So you guys are going to roll out Nightshade by, by 2023. What is your Correct. current volume today as it relates to, for example, like Ethereum? Volume. So we've got about four and a half million wallets on chain and we're doing probably about, I guess, 700,000 transactions per day which isn't a whole lot, but I guess we've got to take a step back, look in the mirror and realize for something that's been on mainnet, they're pretty good numbers, mainnet for two years, they're, they're pretty good numbers. So, you know, we can be proud, but when it comes to um, market cap, we're kind of just a shade of what Ethereum is. But to me, that just means there's a whole lot more upside, right? Sure. Because Ethereum probably, I, look, I love Ethereum. I will never say a bad word against Ethereum, but some of the community is perhaps a little bit myopic um, in the sense that the same way Bitcoin maxis are myopic towards Ethereum. And if you've held Ethereum since it was 15 bucks, of course, you're going to be loyal to it because it's made you stinking rich. Yep. Um, and you don't really have a worry about global participation in your blockchain, right? Yep. Um, we have a goal at the NEAR Foundation of onboarding a billion users to the NEAR protocol in the next five years. Now, lots of people have heard me say it. I use this in my pitch when I'm speaking to teams who are looking to come and build on NEAR, but we know that's a stretch goal, right? Because yep. there's 250 million users of crypto today and only four and a half million of them have NEAR wallets. So mm -hmm. we've still got to onboard 245 million users of crypto onto NEAR, right. but we're not that concerned about those guys. We're concerned about those other 750 million users that don't use crypto at the moment. Right. And we do that with an account-based model, um, which is very, very simple user interface for the wallet. So your name.near is your address, right? And once you set up that near wallet, you have a choice of how actively you, you participate in the ecosystem. So you can recover your wallet with an email link it can be as simple as that. And if you're not holding a lot of value in your Web3 wallet and you're not good with seed phrases and all that kind of stuff, then it's very, very simple to access that wallet just by clicking on a link and recovering it, that, that link if you save it. I'm going to tell you a secret that my wife is not going to hear because she doesn't watch my show. <laughs> I've lost some wallets, Mark. <laughs> yeah, haven't we all? Haven't we all? <laughs> There's just money <laughs> flowing around the Nowhereville uh, because I don't, I don't know where that seed phrase is. Thank you for your sacrifice. <laughs> Thank you for your sacrifice. I've, I must have made some projects a little bit better with my yeah, contribution. Yeah, uh, absolutely. That's total value locked. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But you've got, that, you've got that case if you're a simple user, but then you can go right down to the other extremity if you have a lot of value in your Web3 wallet because mm. you're participating in the DeFi protocols and you're participating in the NFT ecosystem or whatever it is, yep. you can secure it with a hardware wallet too. Yep. So it's get about giving users the choice. You know, do, How involved do you want to get? How much value do you want to have in your, your Web3 wallet? Is it just a case of your identity so you can log on to these applications, have mm -hmm. a poke around, or is it where you're holding some serious value and moving it around the world? So I think my wallet is Johnny.near. J O H N N Y. Well done. Yeah, you must have got a, a wallet pretty quickly. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I'm Johnny dot near. I got I got to check on that, but I'm pretty sure. And if it's not, it's Belitsky dot near, or I might have both. Uh, but but to your point, like the process of setting up that wallet just blows MetaMask away, and you could tell the DNA of of near is a Web two DNA mm -hmm. because it operates like the most efficient Web two products 
but with the enhancement of Web3 products. Uh, exactly, yeah. Which, which I think is actually unique. But we're trying to be, I guess, a Web 2.5 almost, because it's these Web2 businesses that we're really interested in attracting to the blockchain, Web right? Web 2.5? Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> <sighs> Fractional shill. Yeah. Fractional <laughs> shill. <laughs> That's good. I like that. Yeah. Like, who yeah. knew there were in between sizes? Like, I thought you were a size two or size. No. You, you can be, be what you want, half. John. Be what you want. That's what's so great about Web 3.2. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> we can go anywhere with this. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's we, we want to attract not only those businesses, but those developers that are familiar with, with that, um, those programming languages and those interfaces. Um, that's who we're really after uh, so they can come and build and be part of this uh, new internet that we're trying to create yeah I mean I it, there, there's there's something alluring about uh, about near I think because when you interact with it you immediately understand that it it is a little different you know it does have this this different DNA uh, which is unique um, and it's it's a much easier onboarding process I mean how many people have you personally onboarded Oh, wow. I mean, you um, probably do it, what, like every day you get on the phone with somebody, hey, just open up a wallet. I'm, I know I did when I spoke with, with, uh, with Cameron. Yeah. That would be a colleague shill. Colleague shill. Yeah. yeah. A Cameron shill. A Cameron shill. A Cameron shill. He's a good guy, by the way. Yeah, I love him. Absolutely love him. Uh, I love all my other colleagues, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess, I don't know, I must be pretty close to the thousands. Um, wow. So, look... I developed a, a really wide and broad network over the bear market starting in 2018, February 2018, where everything just turned to crap. But I stuck and stuck around because of the technology and made some really good relationships, which is why I'm in the fortunate position I am today with Nia, because I just, you know. You were there. Yeah, I, 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 I grinded, so to speak. And um, these people are the communities that, I just onboarded to near as quickly as I possibly could. And it's very easy because we have uh, an app called uh, Link Drop, I think it is. Uh, and you can basically fund a wallet, say I can fund it with a thousand near, and then I can say, okay, create any amount of links that you want to create. So a hundred, a uh, thousand, 10,000 links of near. Uh, and then you just share that link out to your network. And as soon as they click on the link, they've got a near wallet, which is already pre-funded with near, so they can play around with the ecosystem. So yeah, it's really, really easy to, to go, hey, check wow. this out. That's really cool. We should actually, so, okay, the use case for me for that technology is, you know, our first token that we ever built at Balcony DAO was, was uh, ERC721 on, on the Harmony mm -hmm. chain. Uh, and I, I really love the Harmony project. I've, I've always been sort of an advocate of it, early hodler. And I wanted to build on it. I liked the low gas. I liked the, the people involved with the project. Um, and we did. We released it in Puerto Rico. And, you know, all these whales were there. And they're like, what kind of Ethereum is Harmony? And we're like, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's a different chain. They're like, yeah, I don't, I don't have any of that in my wallet. So I can't even buy your token. Yeah. And I was like, well, you know, there's a faucet. They're like, I don't, I don't even know what that is. They're like, yeah. just... Just exactly. Give me an Ethereum token and I'll buy it. So we gave them an Ethereum token and, you know, to their, to their point, to their credit, they actually did buy it. Um, but it bothered me that the gas fees on a free token we were giving people at that time was like $150. Yeah. Really bothered me. Um, with your product that you just described, what I would do with it is I would turn that into a transactional faucet for anybody, if I was going to build on Near, to just take the link, right? I'd take 10,000 links or 100,000 links and they'd be sequentially numbered. And if somebody didn't have the, you know, de minimis amount of near in their wallet so that they could actually purchase our, our token for the gas fee, for the transaction fee, so they could swap and so forth, it would just, it'd be a faucet. I'd use it as a personal faucet. Exactly. And that's how I'm shaping it with the teams that I am speaking to. So I'm speaking to lots of AAA game studios, um, Web2 applications, all these people that have a whole bunch of users that are not crypto native. So the concept of them having to buy crypto from Binance or KuCoin or whatever it is to then fund a wallet, it's a whole lot of friction that you need to remove if you want to onboard a user to crypto. Mm -hmm. So 
we can build that into like, hey, sign up for the beta of our game. Here's a link for to populate your wallet, and uh, that's how you onboard a billion users to crypto. Yeah, I like. It. I think that's that's absolutely the right move. Um, so, tell me about this now. So, you've got this foundation. You're putting out grants, which, by the way, also thank you for supporting PitchDAO. Um, PitchDAO. For those of you who followed along, PitchDAO is a separate DAO that uh, I'm a co-founder in that is really not profit-driven in any meaningful way. It's just meant to create a space for founders to meet with funders, pitch their projects, get feedback, meet VCs, meet, meet other founders, uh, developers, improve their pitch, improve their product, and move forward. So it's a, it's a resource community at the moment. Um, and Nier gave us some, some capital, actually, so that we can go and evangelize pitched out and bring more founders into the fold. And that process, that grant process was like, you know, 24 hours, maybe 48 hours. I mean, like it was, it was incredibly simple, incredibly easy. And so why don't you tell some people the, the purpose of this grant program, why it exists, what the future of that grant program is and how people can, can access it. Sure. So look, we're an organization that's blitz scaling. We want to go as far as fast as possible. And that involves bootstrapping teams and founders with liquidity to help them achieve their goals, right? So we've got two grants, two grant mechanisms really. So we've got the fast grant system of which PitchDAO was a beneficiary. And that involves uh, a few people within NIA who are qualified to um, disperse those grants, to have a conversation with the team get a sense of their ability to execute, you know, what the project is. And then we have the ability to say, okay, yeah, you guys are worthy. Here's a grant, go forth and build. Um, so yeah, there's a few of us in the team that have that ability, but we have a, a regular grants function for the, the larger, more substantial grants. And basically that involves someone from within the foundation sponsoring that grant. So. Uh, you can submit it via a, a, a link on our webpage where you sort of put detail into your project, um, tell us about what it is, your, your business model, your go-to-market strategy, what are the risks, who are the team, mm -hmm. um, and you know why is this beneficial for the near ecosystem? And then we will have a meeting every two weeks to where the sponsor will effectively uh, pitch your project to the grant committee and it will just be a decision via committee. There'll be a few questions, um, you know, any visible holes will be poked um, because, you know, you're giving out capital to teams. You need to make sure of course. That, that they're good. And it's, it's not venture based. When we give a grant, it's like go forth and build. We're not expecting anything back um, from you. It's a rising tide lifts all boats. You go out there and build a cool, cool project for the near ecosystem then we all benefit, right? Um, so yeah, it's, it's just about when, when I'm looking at grants or when the foundation is looking at grants, we're looking at, I guess, four things or five things really. And, and that's, is it gonna be a publicized event? You know, is, are there gonna be a lot of eyeballs on this? Are people gonna talk about you mm -hmm. coming to build on Nia? You right. know, we want that kind of exposure, good PR, all yep. those kind of things. The next one is, is it gonna create more users? Are more people gonna come to the blockchain and create more wallets? Yep. Um, the next one is, is it gonna bring liquidity to chain? Is are people going to bring a lot of value? Is it going to stay in the ecosystem? Uh, it, you know, is it going to be a sticky application where people are going to you know bring that money and, and keep it here? Yep. The next one is transactions. So you know, are the transactions going to move the move the needle and show that this blockchain there is a lot of activity here? Yep. People are always interacting with it and and using the token for its intended purpose, a gas fee, right? Yep. And the last one is. Um, for a, like, is it a tool for the ecosystem? Is the smart contract going to be open sourced um, that other developers can use and build it later on? And an interesting fact about that is, if you build a smart contract within the near ecosystem, the developer can program uh, uh, to get thirty percent of the gas fees in perpetuity. So, if you're building a smart contract that is used by a mass market uh, enterprise product. Uh, and you're getting millions and millions of transactions a day, and this is what we anticipate in the future, that 30% gas fee will be meaningful. So if you go out there and build a smart contract now that the ecosystem can use, um, 
the developer incentives are there. Okay, let's talk about that for a second. So firstly, the gas fee at the moment is de minimis um, yeah. on your chain as it ought to be. I think, honestly, most of the L1's uh, competitors for, for the top spot have already kind of solved the gas fee problem, um, most of them. So I wouldn't say near is unique in that sense, but you were, I would say, appropriate in the sense that you didn't come out with an L1 that doesn't jive with what's happening in, in the space vis-a-vis -vis gas fees. So it's a small gas fee, but the developers can get 30% of it. The idea is that you know if this becomes a ubiquitous technology, transactions become anything and everything, signing into your email address or you know sending grandma a birthday card or whatever the case may be, and all these things accumulate over time. Next question becomes, that developer, is he developing in Solidity? Is he developing in Rust? What is the ecosystem like for the developer to have the incentive to want to build on Nier? Because I think at the end of the day, it's the devs that are really, I think, driving the, the, the decision on which chain you build on. In my organization, I'm sort of the, the CTO, in, and I say sort of because I don't have a formalized tech background, but I build and I'm selecting the chain for my organization, obviously with consensus among my, my co-founders, my partners. Um, but presumably my input weighs a little bit more than theirs because I could actually build stuff. Why do I want to build on Nier? What am, what, what am I compiling in? T tell me about what that feels like. Well, yeah, aside from that incentive that I just mentioned, we are a Rust-based smart contract language with WebAssembly modules as well. Uh, we've built quite a robust uh, ecosystem for developers uh, or the Nier University, right? So. It's a course in where our team of educators have built out a framework where they think you know any developer that has experience in Java, Python, C Sharp, those kind of things, have they've had you know good experience for five years, they can get them building a smart contract in you know 24 hours, 48 hours. Yeah. Um, that's our goal here. We're we're interested in attracting all those developers that are outside crypto right now, all these developers that have worked at Facebook, Netflix, all these kind of, you know, there's millions of them. Mm -hmm. Whereas, what, there's 30,000 Solidity devs or something like that. Yeah, it'd be great if they come and build on Nier as well, but we want all those devs that haven't really considered building an application for themselves. Um, you know, they're sl slaving away for some Silicon Valley uh, <laughs> master and they, they don't, I don't know, th there's always been this stigma around crypto that it's all about financial products and uh, speculative products and all these kind of things whereas smart contract platforms are anything but yeah it, they're volatile and there's a price attached to the token but ultimately the message that we need to convey and we need to get out there amongst the wider pop populace is that these are software for building on building on top of you know, get away from that value conversation or the price of the token, those kind of things. It's just an open source software that will never change. Mm -hmm. I mean, it will be upgraded, but you will always have access to build on top of this. You won't be deplatformed in any way, shape or form. You always have the ability to iterate and build on top of that platform. And we want to attract those developers. Come and build something, come and try something yourself um, rather than working for some uh, you know, wage slave master or something like that, whatever you call these guys in the world that's not Web3. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I for me, I, it clicked for me when the Yo app came out. Do you remember the Yo app yeah. during the app craze? Yeah. It was like the stupidest thing in the world and everybody was furious because they raised money and the only way, the only thing that happened is like if you hit a button, it would say Yo and you could send a Yo to somebody. So I, I like, I'd Yo you and you'd be like Yo and then you were able to go Yo. And Amazing. Then, and, you know, and everyone was just like, <laughs> like, this is the stupidest shit in the world. And I was just like, it is really stupid, except it's a binary. And this is like the V1 of a binary where you have a very, you know, you have only two potential outcomes and we're aggregate them. Like, can you turn a Yo app into something else? And in some ways, smart contracts are just like really sophisticated Yo apps. Right, where it's like, did the user sign the wallet, then this happens? Did the user fulfill this portion yeah. of the contract? So each one of these sort of components inside of these smart contracts are basically yo's. If this, then that. If this, then that. Yeah. They're just a bunch of yo's. Mm -hmm. um, and they only function in a contract form, which on its surface sounds like, duh, this sounds like the most inane conversation, except Solidity, Rust, smart contracts, they only transact. They only transact. They don't do anything else. Mm -hmm. And they transact to your point for perpetuity. They don't get deprecated. Yep. You don't make a smart contract and then it's like, no, we don't use that anymore. Like it exists for perpetuity, um, as does your coin. And so like, that's, that's a really powerful 
concept uh, that I think people are just now starting to grok. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, you know, what this looks like. I think I understand what this looks like five or 10 years from now. I think we, we get to a point where everything is tokenized, every asset. That's, those are the conversations that we have in my circle. Otherwise, what are we doing? Otherwise, what are, we doing? <laughs> are we wasting our life? Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Otherwise, we're just talking about JPEGs. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, but I think Cat everything pictures. Does. Yeah. yeah, I think everything does get tokenized. You know, my next question, though, is when everything does get tokenized, do we live in a world where there's one L1? You know, are you wasting your time? Is there one winner? Is it, is, do you think this becomes a zero-sum situation where it's like either near one or lost? No, absolutely not. Like, we fundamentally believe in a multi-chain world. I personally believe that all value accrues to the application, right? It doesn't even matter what chain it is. You have right. to abstract away that complexity of the software it's on. When I'm playing Call of Duty, I don't really care if it's on a PlayStation or Xbox or right. PC, I'm playing Call of Duty. Um, so all value should accrue to the application. It's just about making the base layer technology a good place for builders to come and build right so that user experience is a positive one. It needs to be quick, it needs to be intuitive, um, and as an L1, you just need to make sure that you're providing an environment so developers can build that thing that they want to build so they can get the users they want to use and, uh, you know, come to the chain. And whichever applications do provide that smooth user experience, um, you know, that is what it is. Hopefully they're built on near, they might be built on other chains or whatever it is, but the bridges are being built now to make sure that if it does involve, if these applications do involve uh, liquidity, you know, we're working with other teams, other chains to make sure that the user has that choice, right? The decision should always be in the hands of the user. And, and that's kind of the open web uh, ethos, right? You know, let them make the decisions, do what they yep. want to do, just give them the environment so they can do what they want to do. So the bridges between other chains that they're happening and we're, we're more than happy. Uh, we've got a really good trustless bridge, the rainbow bridge between yes, Ethereum. Ethereum. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I don't know, if uh, your, your viewers have used that bridge, but I've used- I'm a, sure my viewers have used that bridge. Yeah, well, I, I've used a lot of bridges in my day. And like, yeah, I've drunk the Kool-Aid, but that is the best bridge experience. Why, is it more secure? That's, that's but, one question. It's right? completely trustless, right? Yep. Um, and it's very, very quick. And uh, from a technical level, like it's gonna go over my head. I don't know why um, we haven't had the security um, concerns that other bridges have, have had. Uh, I've seen the developers talk about it. Bridges are scary they, they, and they're dangerous. Yeah, yeah, absolutely they are. Absolutely they are. But we're talking to highly regulated partners who move a lot of money and they are very open to using the Rainbow Bridge. Um, so if it's passing their checks, um, then, you know, I'm happy with that. But it's a very, very smooth experience. Well, I think that at some point we should get the, the, the techs on the show to tell us just why that bridge is so good. Which, by the way, future shill show shill. Future <laughs> shill show shill. <laughs> we should bring them on. We should figure out why your bridge. Because when I was a kid, the base of the Manhattan Bridge, the Brooklyn Bridge, the Williamsburg Bridge, you came over with your little bicycle. That was where you got smashed across the face with a bat and you got your bike stolen. <laughs> Bridges were dangerous places. <laughs> like, true story, you didn't want to ride over the bridge, any of those bridges in the 80s and 90s in New York City. Bridges are dangerous places. In our business, the bridges are the, the liminal space in between these chains where the security protocols break down and people are vulnerable, right? They're like, sort of this like caravan of troops moving through. Like Don't a, scare people, John. You're scaring people. <laughs> Boogeyman shell. <laughs> Boogeyman <laughs> shell. <laughs> Look, I'm not trying to scare people. I'm just saying, if you're going to get smashed across the face coming off a bridge, it's going to be coming off a bridge. Like, it's, yeah. it's the bridges are the bridges. Yeah. Um, and well, so, yeah. I, would, I, would like to, I would like to dig into that. That said, every L1 protocol that wants to play in the space and be serious must have these bridges because people want to live in a multi-chain world. So, you know, the, the question I asked about, is it a zero-sum game? Obviously, I don't believe that, but many people do. I think they're wrong. You know, I happen to think that, you know, the near concept of if New York is Ethereum and LA is Solana, then near protocol is San Francisco. I think that that sort of like city rubric to understand 
the unique selling proposition of each individual chain applies here and that there's use cases for these chains mm -hmm. and they live in, in some kind of an ecosystem that works. And then the only thing that happens next is, you know, what gets built on that. And that is, you know, the, if, if chains are cities, then D apps are, are buildings, are the yeah. size group, sure. right? And I think at this point, you guys have like, what, 131 D apps on, on chain? Yeah. And how did these 131 D apps get there? And what's the goal? Like, you, you guys seem very goal oriented. You're very web two and a half in that sense. Like, there must be a, a whiteboard with a circle around it, and it's got a number of D apps on it or something. Like, what's the number? Well, it's a user-based goal. Like I said, our goal is 1 billion users. Right. Like, that's the goal. That's the North Star. That's the metrics. And whether that's done with 131 D apps or whether that's done with 1,000 D apps, it is what it is. But it's all about bringing those users. And to do that, we need to attract the developers. We've got a mindset that you create a, an ecosystem, a friendly ecosystem for the developers where they can learn and, you know, be inspired to build and get the support they need to build. They'll look after that killer app. They will bring that killer app. It's the developers that make this stuff, right? Once they build whatever it is they want, then the users will come. Look after the, the developers, then the users will come. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's an interesting, the, the, the city analogy is an interesting one because we're a general purpose blockchain, right? It doesn't matter what kind of app you want to build, but it is interesting to see who is gravitating towards the chain. Oh I, yeah, tell I, us about that. Who yeah, is? well I think probably 70% of the conversations that I've had from a business development point of view are around the creative industries, creative spaces. So um, as well as sort of marketing technology, um, but I'm speaking to a lot of uh, musician NFT kind of platforms that are, are very interested in creating environments for musicians and content creators to own their audience right you mm -hmm. know because you know you might have several million instagram followers but that's not your audience they're instagram yep. audiences right so yep. you're renting starting, your audience exactly so we're starting to look at ways that these creators can actually own their own audience and build campaigns from the metadata on the blockchain right you don't need to know you know, the age, the sex, or any details of your user, you just need to know when they perform a transaction based on their wallet address. So mm -hmm. I send you a campaign with an NFT, here's X amount off this gig, this show, this album, et cetera, et cetera. You can judge from that activity on the blockchain exactly when that user was activated based on when you sent them that thing. So you can mm -hmm. create really intelligent campaigns that are more targeted towards people rather than what we see in web two at the moment, which is just a massive email campaign yep. market and you get all this spam and you don't even look at things anymore. Yep. So yep. blockchain is, is enabling those really targeted campaigns to users based on an address, right? Um, we had this conversation, the, the last shoot that we did with Nifty Labs. Are you familiar with Nifty yeah, Labs? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, you, you know them? Yeah. Do you know Ty at Nifty? I don't know Ty. Ty's, a, person, Ty's but... a great guy. Uh, I sat in that chair. We had this conversation exactly about that graph uh, and exactly about how they're, they're doing token gating as a service and particularly how they're doing it inside of the Web 2 meets Web 3 space in marketing and in music. Mm. And that's sort of uh, a, a big part of, of their focus. And I think that you're exactly right, and I think he's exactly right. I think you guys are onto something. The ability for like me to exist as a wallet address, um, or more appropriately, as many wallet addresses. I always say like as a biracial person, it's like I identify in many different ways. Mm -hmm. So I would want a wallet address just for my musical interest, and I'd want a wallet address just for my, you know, uh, real estate interest, and a wallet address just for my technology interest, yeah. and so forth. And I would welcome people shilling me into that address by giving me meaningful uh, you know, discounts, giving me meaningful passes yep. to go participate in these things. And I would appreciate the fact that they're doing that based off of you know, X0, X, AB4, not John Belitsky, this person who they've developed some kind of a profile on that makes me feel like I've, I've had my, my privacy invaded uh, and I'm being financialized. I don't wanna be financialized. Yeah but I don't mind my wallet address being financialized. Yeah, exactly. You know? And I, I think that, that that is the future of, of what you're describing. Yeah, 100%. So it, it's those guys as well as, I'm speaking to a lot of game, game studios recently. Um, 
this uh, play to earn thing is Exploring. really, really exciting. Um, there's a, a huge moat to cross as far as you know gamers and their experience with NFTs and their understanding of NFTs. Um, but the development studios, they're certainly thinking about it. And it's interesting because we have exposure to crypto teams that want to develop a game, but now the inverse is true. We've got these huge game studios that have had, you know, one and a half billion downloads of their, their games on the app stores. And they're coming to us saying, okay, now how, how do we how do integrate we, yep. Web3 and build these SDKs? Mm -hmm. um, which is going to just spark a, a massive bull run of activity. It's about building the infrastructure that enables you know, games on Unity, Unreal Engine, those kind of things to plug into the blockchain. Um, so that's what we're really excited about. Yeah, so I, the call I had literally before you walked in here for us to meet today was with uh, a very astute, I'm gonna say crypto influencer, although that sounds just gross, but I guess that's what he is. He's a really good guy. He's still, he knows our business. He has, he's opinionated, uh, and he does a good job of sort of breaking things down. He has been looking at the, the, the play-to-earn space very closely. I have as well. We're looking at things like Axie Infinity that's having sort of like this collapsing moment where there aren't new users coming in, people aren't earning as much as they used to to play, and what's left is a game that is not as good as the financial incentives. Exactly. Which might be, maybe that's a harsh way to say it. Sorry, you know, like that's that's kind of the consensus among gamers who played around with it and left it. They were just like, you know, I want to play Call of Duty. I want to like, you know, like you it's going to be play and earn, not play to earn. You want to play, that's right. play the game, right. play and exactly. earn. And exactly. it's also forming an in interesting dynamic with learn and earn. So there's really what? good, yeah, exactly, man. So what um, is that? That yeah. sounds like. <laughs> Ooh, that sounds like it's right down my alley. I'd like to learn and earn. Well, it's it's an old concept. Coinbase have been doing it for a long time. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You it's, click, but, you take a little thing, you get you get some some tokens. But it's, but now you know we're working with various different studios who are you know building that into a game, right? You right. know, learning things, doing different activities, and building that into a Web three experience. So um, imagine you work for you know some massive global conglomerate, you mm -hmm. know, HR organization needs you to go through some, I don't know, anti-money laundering training or, yep. you know. Um, Which we have to do, by the way. Yeah, the it, exactly. Yeah, of course. Or anti-harassment training or anything yep. like that. You know, you go through this learn and earn kind of thing and you get actually tokenized rewards mm -hmm. um, because of going through this campaign. So the use cases are, are infinite, infinite for yep. that kind of um, platform. So. Look, it's just. Can you so make one for Rust? I mean, because that it's. I mean, it sounds it's, like you're dedicating happening. a lot of time. It's happening. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, it's happening. So uh, I was very fortunate to give a grant to a team who have this kind of experience in doing it with languages. So they have a, a learn like a Duolingo uh, type yeah, of thing. Yeah, exactly. So they've built a platform with languages, and they're like, okay, now we're going to bring it to the blockchain space. And and part of the grant was, yeah, we're going to help you out and support you. But the first thing you do is onboarding a user to Nia. Right. You know, do, do that kind of campaign. So, yep. yeah, and they're all they're all for it. And who who funds that in the future? Uh, you know, like travel companies, you know, airlines and hotels, I guess it's like... It's a SaaS-based product, right? right? You know, so, right. you know, anyone that needs that product, you right. buy a licensing fee, they develop the content, those kind of things. Right, straight licensing, not advertising. And then, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. That's also really cool, is this idea of licensing being more valuable than advertising. That's... That's sort of a new thing because we've lived in, in you know, the past 20 years, every project that existed on a screen was there really to monetize your eyes. Yeah. Um, and so this idea of licensing is, I think, really appealing to a lot of people who feel like saturated in nonsense for the past two decades, um, which is another benefit of, I think, of, of crypto, of the blockchain. I think we're moving more towards that direction. So, Okay. We've talked about the D apps. We've talked about the the grants that you guys provide. We've talked about the philosophy. We've talked about the criteria to receive the grants. We've talked about the objectives of the Near Foundation. I think now our viewers understand the pedigree, which you know I think the the cap table, the cap table at Near is just freaky. <laughs> I mean, it's just freaky. Like I, I feel like a lot of different ways about it. You know, because I look at it and I say like these are 
the names. Like these are like the guys. If you were gonna make like a money all star team, uh, this would be the money that you that you'd field. Like, wh- where the hell did you find these people? Like, how did Near get a sixteen and jump and like and the list goes on and on and on. Like you don't have you don't have like a low key VC in the whole cap table. It's just monsters. Like, what? How did this happen? Well, they find us. It's it's their job, right? Um, Where? How? <laughs> yeah, I, look, you'd have to ask them. But uh, I think we'll go back to the team. I think a lot of them were following like Ilya and Alex to see what they did, right? Yeah. Um, and they've obviously done something really, really cool. And I pinch myself every day that I work with people that intelligent. And like you say, at a business where those kind of VCs want to get involved in the ecosystem. I am obviously very, very long on near because I bet my career on it. You know, I took a risk out of a traditional FinTech job and, you know, did my due diligence and the amount of positive confluence that came up for me without my wider network, as well as, you know, those kind of investors backing, backing the team um, was just off the charts. And I, look, I'm so lucky to be able to do what I do with the team that I do it with. Um, and it's still so early. It, it's mean, but we are so early at near. We, we haven't are. been two years on main net. Um, I mean, we should be higher than, than we are from a, a market perception point of view. Look, why is Cardano where it is? Who knows? From the, you know, they've just got this unreal marketing engine yep. that you know the normies, I guess, they all seem to like ADA and buy ADA or yep. whatever it is. Like from a technology platform um, that already has scalability fully baked in, you know, the environmentally friendly proof of stake consensus mo- model, um, essentially what F2 wants to be, we're already there. We're already doing it, right? Um, so, yeah, it's it's just an honor to be able to work with everyone there and the VCs. It's been, they're really, really helpful. They're always looking at ways that they can help grow the ecosystem. They're interested in incubating the projects that are coming to build, um, accelerating their growth and their development. Um, we're just fortunate to have the community that we have both from a user participation point of view, the NFT community is absolutely, you know, it's really starting to kick off there. Um, That's such a huge part of like the the parabolic growth in these L1s is when somebody has an experience building an NFT on it and they're like, oh, I like this better. And that project then gets some, some acclaim and then users sort of just ape into the L1 because of the NFT. I mean, it's just, just happens that way. It's the Trojan horse. Uh, the NFTs absolutely... are, are definitely the way that you get people excited about um, the blockchain and the activity there. And can I tell you what I think that is? Because I, I you're I, going to, aren't you? I'm going to tell you anyway. Yeah, yeah. Because it's part it's part of what we're doing, right? <laughs> we don't understand stuff that we can't see. Like, there's a reason why humans have eyes. Yeah. Right. Like, we just sit here and talk forever, but. It just doesn't, you don't get it until you see it, right? Mm-hmm. So with Balcony Dow, bring it back, Shell. <laughs> with Balcony Dow, we take these buildings and we've attached these images and these videos and this multimedia and music. We've attached these things to our Balcony D token because we're demonstrating to people what an NFT can do. Yeah. And we're going to be actually showing you your investment. You take an abstract concept like your investment. Like, what the hell is that? Like, you, what, is, what is an investment? Well, if I can take that and put it in your literal wallet, now you can use your eyes to understand what this is. Yep. Now it's, it's near. Pun shill. Pun, Pun shill. <laughs> <laughs> right? You've brought it nearer. You've taken that abstract concept. You've made it real. Yep. Um, and so I, that's why I think NFTs are so powerful. It's like, it's not the fact that it's a pixelated ape. It's the fact that it's an image and we happen to like to use our eyes a lot in our species. And that image is better than no image. Yeah. And the blockchain has no image. And, you know, your token has no image. Mm. It doesn't have any of, of these attributes. Yeah. Pixelated ape, antisocial ape club shill. Pixelated, pixelated ape, 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 ape club shill. 
That's me. Yeah, my favorite, my favorite NFT project. It's, it's just a pixelated aim. That's all it is. It's ridiculous, but yeah, I love it. The the, the community that has you know developed around it. They um, their Discord was basically you know why is the floor price not 0.1 near? That's way too high. They basically just fud themselves all the, the entire time, <laughs> and. Uh, there's a, a big international cricketer by the name of Ben Stokes, probably one of the best cricketer um, in England. And even he got involved and he started tweeting about it, but uh, he caught some pain from you know the cricket fans who have no idea about NFTs. They're like, oh, you're killing the planet, Ben Stokes, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> it's a pixelated ape, for goodness sake. And it's made on a carbon neutral blockchain. So, you know, it's just these people that just refuse to educate themselves it's challenging, but you know that's that's why I love my job because I, I will get on a pedestal yep. and I'll start to talk about the technology, how it is so much more than a pixelated ape. Yep. But these pixelated apes are so cool. They are really cool. <laughs> they are really cool. I'm I'm a big fan too. I got I got me some some pixelated apes as well. I like to play with them. Um, I I enjoy them. I just, you know, there's also this thing where you feel like you're being you're participating in a moment in time. It's like there wasn't much to participate in in Web One and Web Two where you could own your little piece of that moment. But these little pixelated apes are, you know, your only little piece of that moment. It's, I want to talk a second about the, the carbon neutral point because uh, although Nier does an excellent job of that, even the worst offenders don't do a terrible job of that to the extent that the detractors make it seem. Like basically every, I would say, 60 to 90 days, a new FUD narrative around crypto develops, mm -hmm. right? It's, uh, it's a money laundering tool. It's being used to, you know, fuel the eating of babies in like basements of pizza shops in D.C. Yeah, uh, it's killing the entire environment. It's not decentralized. It's not really decent as if like there's like like there's a, a threshold that you meet where then like the government says you have officially achieved decentralization and they give you like a decentral stamp or something <laughs> like there's a bunch of these like, you know, ridiculous red herring. Arguments. We want that stamp. You, we love, we you know what? Stamp. I'll tell you what. I will sell you that stamp. I will make it an NFT on the near blockchain. You give me a grant, and I'll stamp yeah. you. <laughs> that's our goal, right? That that that's that's one of the criticisms that is labeled towards near, yeah, like it's not decentralized enough, which is why a lot of F people, you know, don't really look at us or give us any credit because they're all about that decentralization. For goodness sake, we're two years old. Just give us some time. Right. That's we are absolutely all about the decentralization. And my goal at the foundation. Well, the the, is, the, the shards is like that's the beginning of like hyper decentralization. Yeah, right? absolutely, absolutely. Just give us some time. You no one can be fully decentralized in in day one, and we are serious about it. I, I want to make myself redundant. I don't want to mm. work at the foundation. Like we want the community to look after itself in the yep. long term. That's our goal. We are all about the decentralization. It's, you know, aside from the one billion users, that's also, you know, very much part of who we plan to be. Yeah. So the, the, the decentralization, knock, first of all, like I want to make this totally clear because I spent so much time telling people this on like Twitter and everything. Decentralization is an ideal type like mm -hmm. justice or love. You know, it's your ideas. Just work towards it. You work towards them. You never get there. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to ever get to justice. You don't no. ever get to democracy. You don't. You don't ever like achieve love. Like, you work towards these things. It's a. It's a process. It's a labor. I've got an interesting one for you, John. That's why we're called near, because we'll always be nearly there. Is that you know, actually true? Yeah, we, we will. We will never be complete. We will never be finished. We will always be nearly there. You sound like a New York City infrastructure project. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like the FDR drive. <laughs> you sound like a subway line we're never actually going to get right. Yeah, well, you know, you've always got to be iterating, working, improving. That's Absolutely. What, that's what we're about. Absolutely. So, okay, so if we want to talk about decentralization as an ideal type, and we should for just one second, here's the thing. You can't decentralize something where the participants don't have accountability. And you can't have accountability unless you have familiarity and you can't have familiarity with people who have absolutely no exposure. And so the whole point is if you want to build a community that takes over these these components of this project and run them autonomously like DAOs, like Balcony DAO, the first thing you have to do is you have to make sure they're competent in, yeah. in the material that they're managing. Otherwise, that's not decentralized. That's abdicating responsibility. That's yeah. like, you know, my, when my kids wake up, they're not like, they're thinking about the... 
chocolate bars for breakfast today. I'm like, you know what? We're decentralized around here. Yeah. Knock yeah. yourself out. <laughs> you know, first you raise them. Then they can go do that when they're, you know, yeah. adults, you know? And so you have to build these communities in that way. And I think people don't realize that. Well, that's the goal of the foundation, just making sure that we steer the community in the right direction because these guys haven't thought about um, liability from a tax point of view. They haven't yep. thought about um, hiring strategies. They haven't thought about go-to-market strategies for that. Like, we've just got to try and shepherd them in, in the right direction and you know be a steward, mm -hmm. which is a long process, like you say. It is a long process. Um, I think... I think that has been a pretty overall, I think, good overarching discussion about what Nier is. There's a lot of people uh, who are very familiar with Nier who really like Nier uh, for many reasons, but there's a lot of people who are not really hip to what you guys are doing. So I hope this was like a good entry point where they can kind of learn a little bit about your work at Nier and what Nier is trying to accomplish and how you guys want to get there, a little sense for your roadmap. Um, but before we let you go on the show, we let people shill out. So if you want to shill us out and give the viewers your your shill on why Nier should be their L1 of choice, by all means, balcony and shill. Yeah. Well, the best shill is active participation. Just download a wallet, have a play around, go to the Paras for, a, a DeFi, uh, for the NFT marketplace, um, take a look at, you know, just maybe buy an NFT, uh, just download a wallet, use the wallet for yourself. That's the best shield you'll ever get from me. It's that user experience and it will feel different from any other blockchain experience you've had. Um, yeah, just go out there, come and join us because we, we love our community. Uh, we talk about being in L1, but the community is our L0. We're nothing without the community. So come and play, come and join us and uh, hit me up if you've ever got any questions. I like that. That shill, I'm going to call the Capital One shill. You know why? <laughs> why? What's in your wallet, shill? <laughs> What's, What's in your wallet, wallet shill? <laughs> yeah. That was a Capital One shill. Well, yeah. I've got no idea what that is, John, but sounds yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> capital One. What's in your wallet? All right. It's a, okay. Fine. American thing, right? Yeah, it's an American yeah. thing. Maybe it was a little bit deep cut for the Australian market. Yeah. <laughs> what can I tell you? Uh, no, great having you. I really appreciate the time. Uh, I also appreciate your support of Pitched Out, which, you know, again, even though that's not a project where I have any sort of like financial incentive, it's something I do believe in. I think that other founders need it. I know you believe in that project. And one of the, the great affirmations that you get in the space is when people like you see stuff that people like me and, and our 37 organizing members now are putting together. And you're like, yeah, that makes sense. We want to help and be a part of that. And so on behalf of all of Pitch Dow, thank you for that. Uh, on behalf of Balcony Dow, I will say that we will look into Near, uh, which is an EVM compatible, you know, chain. Aurora. We didn't even get into Aurora, so that, that's another session for another time. So oh, man. Aurora is the layer two built on top of Near, which is the EVM compatible um, chain. So it's basically a smart contract built on top of Near and EVM, the language you know and love, but has as near, has Near's. Low gas, co low gas costs and blockchain finality. So look, we, you gave us the alfalfa. We like that. We like all of all of us crypto rabbits like to eat the alfalfa. So we like that. We appreciate that. You gave us a few different shills that we hadn't heard before. We got a pretty good overview of the whole thing. You told people how to get money from you out of a grant. I think we're done here. Yeah. I think it's time to go back to uh, Avalanche Summit and see what else we can't learn. Convert some heathens. <laughs> Convert some yeah, heathens. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's great. Thanks for having me. Had a good time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I, always, I had to ask, by the way, what the fuck is that? <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of a pun on Nakamoto, yeah. but cats on the internet and dough as in money. Yes. So, <laughs> Nakamoto. It's obviously no, not no. a very good pun if I have to explain it right. <laughs> some people get it, some people don't. Mm. You know. Let me tell you how much you have to explain things in life. <laughs> That's not just Mark with a K, it's Mark with an M. <laughs> <laughs>